Yeah, if it's possible. Yes, of course it is. Yeah, this is, uh, you see, is um, Chinese, um, Chinese, uh, Chinese was to, uh, number three of uh, top ten in China. Oh, yeah, oh, no. Taiwan <coughs> and uh, mainland China. So, yeah, what can I tell you? Um, I mean, you have seen, and it seemed that, that it didn't bother you very much that they were talking French and, uh, and German. Yeah, it's because they are wonderful, they are wonderful um, actors, and they played wonderfully together. They were just, uh, the three of them were just matching perfectly well. And uh, in selecting actors, this is one of the aspects also. And of course, they were interested in music. They, they were playing music themselves. Uh, yeah. I just wonder, I'm going to go to the actors course, and I'm so amazed how sh Martina learned the piano. And I, I just wonder how long time she had to learn the piano. And how three yeah. months. Three months. And she worked every day, like playing? Not only every day, every hour. Every hour, yes. In three months. OK. That's good. Because it's, it's so difficult. It's so difficult. And it's so difficult to, I mean, because she had to do it quite, I mean, when you play with an orchestra and with a real orchestra, you have really to be in the right moment and the right uh, thing. You know, it's you, you can you can't think this is A and this is B and this is you know D and C and E and all. The, you you have to to do it like 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 you 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 march on the street without thinking what your feet's doing. Yeah, that is that is how what is really when you are a big pianist is what what happens is that your your fingers do their things and. Uh, Quite uh, not automatically, but they do them. It's just, it is inside, like when when you are with uh, ten fingers writing, they do that. They are they, the fingers are are trained for that, and they have to be trained. And to do that in three months is incredible. But uh, I mean, actors anyway are incredible. When they are wonderful, they are just uh, unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wonderful people. How did uh, you develop the script? Mm -hmm. Um, I had to fight 12 years for this film. And uh, out of these 12 years, uh, my, my uh, preferred actress for this, uh, for this Clara Schumann was Isabelle Huppert. And uh, we had a very, very wonderful relationship. But uh, Finally, we could not make it because um, the, the, I think the, my co-producer, my German co-producer had a kind of a dispute with her and she said, no, I cannot. Uh, which was, uh, which meant also that I had to completely change because I had all the time been thinking of Isabel and uh, of uh, of the actors I could choose from Germany, as uh, because in in, in international co-productions you have to think of one actor has to be from France, two actors have to be from Germany, or two actors have from to be from France, and one actor has to be from Germany. These are things that that are important in these uh, kinds of uh, work, and um, well, there has always been. For me, an alternative, uh, Martina Gedek. I found her a really remarkable, remarkable actress in the films I had seen where she acted in. And uh, when Isabel told me that she would not work with this uh, production, I, with me, yes, but not with this production. I, um, and I had to work with this production because I had no choice. I then said, well, um, let's try Martina. Uh, not immediately, but I had another alternative that was uh, Hélène Grimaud. Hélène Grimaud is, is a pianist, a very famous p 
pianist, maybe the Clara Schumann of today. She is, she is French. She's very beautiful, extremely beautiful, and she's really a great pianist. And we, I had, uh, I had a um, casting, not a casting, um, a, a rehearsal with her, with camera, to see whether she, how she would be as an actress. And I can tell you it was a complete failure. A complete failure. She is, when you hear her play Schumann and Brahms, she's just working now in Brahms. She, she didn't uh, so far, but uh, recently she, she had a CD with uh, Brahms. Uh, it's wonderful. It is just a big dialogue between her and the, and the, uh, the music, the composed music. But then, uh, in front of a camera, she, she couldn't stop laughing and uh, she was not concentrated. She tried to turn her back on the camera. Uh, when I tried to, ha to get into a kind of dialogue with her in front of the camera, she, she, she was just laughing and finding that very, very funny and, and absolutely stupid. <laughs> and uh, I, I, yeah, I was very sad because I had built up a quite a strong relationship with her, and uh, she thought, "Oh, yeah, let's let's go on and let's try it again." She didn't know how crucial things like that are when you have to decide about a film of this size, which is not a small film. It, it came out that that she was uh, she reminded me of the time that I had spent in the first days of learning about movies with uh, Pasolini and Maria Callas, the singer. I told you yesterday, or it's one of these days, that I was kind of a... I mean, I arrived on that shooting, and um, uh, I got immediately a contact with uh, Pier Paolo, and uh, Pier Paolo told me uh, that I should... Uh, I, I could, might stay on the shooting and uh, help Miss Callas a little bit in her suffering, in her personal sufferings. So I stayed and had to do a lot with uh, Maria Callas, and I saw how she suffered when she was in front of a camera. Because for um, a music person like, like Callas or like, like uh, Hélène Grimaud, uh, they, they, they have a quite an, a different perception of time. For us, the time that you see in a film is composed out of many bits of time that are separately made. Whereas when you are a singer and you start singing, like we were dancing yesterday to the music of La Traviata, which I, which I gave a little bit in order also to understand to today what is music is, is really the, the whole of the music. The whole thing that you go through and that you develop from one point to another when you sing an aria or when you, when you get in with the, with the orchestra. The feeling of, of, of a person like Callas or like Grimaud is, is that this is has to come out of their heart, and it gets with uh, with Grimaud. It gets into your hands, and then it is music, and it has to go on. It has to go on. This feeling has to go on. And when you said now stop, oh, that is horrible. They have. The, they think that it, this is just like killing them. You know. <laughs> well, and that's that's shortly said is the reason why I why I finally decided to to speak to uh, Martina, because I thought it is better to have a great actress. She might become also, for the movies, a pianist, but the pianist will not become an actress. This is two different kinds of work, and I've never seen that so clearly as in these two experiences of my first, one of my first steps in cinema, and this was maybe one of my last steps in cinema, uh, that this doesn't fit in. It's, it's different kinds of working in time, with time. I, let's go back to Pasolini, because uh, there will be people who would like to know how I met Pasolini. 
Um, I was I was kind of a schizophrenic person. I was uh, very much left wing, uh, and at the same time, I was a television speaker, television announcer. At that time, that was very bourgeois and very you know the these uh, hairdos that they had uh, hair like this and uh, uh, very you, very you had to be very polite in front of the camera yeah and uh, well uh, when I had done that some for some time I asked them whether I could go to Italy to do interviews with these directors and they're a good idea wonderful and uh, I had a very small team and we went down to Italy but I didn't know a word of Italian so I sat down for Yes, I know Adio and I know knew uh, Buongiorno, uh, but I didn't really speak Italian. So I sat down and learned Italian in three weeks. But really, uh, in a way that I could speak to Paolo Pasolini, I, philo philosophically, soci sociologically, all that. And uh, we were invited to the shooting of Medea, and uh, me and my team and. Uh, this was kind of the first shootings I ever did. And uh, we, we came to Ostia. Ostia is the beach of Rome. And uh, he was shooting there a little, yeah, almost at the same spot where later on he died. And um, the, the cars of, of the team and of our, our, our little car, we ha all had to park uh, on the hill behind, uh, I mean, there was kind of a hill, how do you, dune, and then there was the beach, uh, and we had to hi park behind that dune, and um, I, we were, I was on top of that dune when I had left the car, and I saw downstairs, and it was in the night, it was in the night at three o'clock, three, three to four, it was complete darkness, but Downstairs, they had already um, they had already built up the the set for the shooting, which were the rails for for the camera and uh, the light and the lights from from the land side because they were waiting for the sun to rise over the Mediterranean Sea. And what was to be shot, it's not in the film Medea, he cut it out afterwards, like you see, sometimes things are cut out. Uh, it was four m naked men on brown skinned, on brown horses, and with curly hair and with muscles and snails in their hair. And they were sitting on these horses waiting for the sun to rise. And uh, I stood there on high on the top of this dune, seeing all that downstairs. And uh, then the sun would, uh, you know, come up, a very small part of the sun would come up, and the whole thing started to move. And it was uh, motore, which is the Italian word for rolling, motore, azione. And then the, the four horses with the four men went off into the sea, which was, you know, uh, going like this. And behind was the sun. And it was a, an incredible moment where for me, uh, the memory of what is our culture? I mean, the memory of uh, Greek culture, of Roman culture, of, and the the present, that present of that morning, that night morning, uh, came together. And I thought this is the most wonderful thing a human being can do. And there was a small man standing next to me, whom I didn't, hadn't noticed before, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and of course the cinema lights were a little bit on, on us so that I could see him, and he had eyes like fire, you know, really like two black fires. And he said, you will do cinema one day, huh? Tu vai fare cinema un giorno, no? And I said, si, si. 
And he said, come with us, come with us. Yene <laughs> And uh, yeah, and uh, I must say, I, we, we did that interview and uh, somehow we had immediate contact and uh, he, the next morning I was invited to stay with him and uh, I had already a chair which said Helma on it. And uh, I was somehow pampered for one time by destiny because then I had a wonderful time. I mean, I went on making my interviews and I, I came when I had time. And then I just simply said, I stayed. And uh, when I went back to Germany after that, uh, for a short weekend, I, I was uh, then engaged to be married. I gave my ring back and I said, uh, I'm going another way. And uh, I have still remained on that way until today. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is a, a very special experience, and um, it was then part of the uh, of the kind of uh, court that uh, they had different courts in 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 uh, Italy because uh, at that time it had still kind of feudalism with these big great directors that were there. There was a special court of the Duke of Visconti, of whom you have seen uh, Pascal Gregory who was a member at that time, as he was still very young, very beautiful guy. And uh, uh, other courts were uh, the court of uh, Fellini. And my court was the court of Pasolini, which was very uh, rarely seen by, by Pasolini, who had the nickname the Pope with us. Uh, he, he was often away, and uh, but but we were one, this was a wonderful group of people: Alberto Moravia, um, Jean Marie Straub, um, Bellocchio, Bertolucci. So we had kind of a yeah very interesting time. I had a very interesting time, the most compact time of my life. Uh, Hans Werner Henze, the composer. Uh, for a short time, there was uh, even um, Ingeborg Bachmann. Well, I mean, this is uh, this is uh, this is the beginning. And uh, but together with uh, my own work in front of the TV, where I saw these films and I wrote down from where has he put where has he put the light to have this light. How did the camera move, you know, from where to where? What was the lens? All these kinds of things that I, I tried to find out, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, this is... Uh, uh, I have to say that before I did that, I had been to an actor's school, so acting was before taught to me by very wonderful teachers. But this was the period then when I learned to make film, and in 69, 70, I did my first film. And in 73, I uh, did my first really big movie with big studio and everything. Yeah. Please, uh, there is a question up there. Are you cutting your films? Uh, I'm, I'm cutting, not cutting my films myself, no. I, I'm not making the camera myself. I'm not... Uh, setting the lights myself, uh, I'm not uh, editing myself. I need another person. I need another person to be next to me, to be with me, and uh, another person who takes up my rhythm, who, take, who understands my brain's working, but uh, I, wouldn't, I, I don't like to do it all alone. I have tried it, but it's, it's not good. Do you work with the same uh, person? Uh, no, no, not necessarily. I'm, I'm not working with the same person all the time, uh, no. But I like to work with the, with the same person for some films. Uh, f like Clara, I think, was the film uh, for, for Jürgen Jürgens as director of photography, whose work you know from Germany Pell Mother. But, for example, the film um, under the pavement is the beach that I made with Thomas Mao. He is also the, the same di the director of photography of uh, the film uh, No Mercy No Future. No Mercy No Future is also his work. So I'm I'm sometimes uh, it's the same, sometimes not. Um, Future of Emily is one of the 
real grand photographers. Uh, that's Sasha Vianney, the photographer of Bunuel and uh, Peter Greenaway. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I love to work with uh, these very, uh, yeah, grand people. <laughs> It's, uh, it's always wonderful because it's so easy to understand each other and it's to, you, have to, you don't have to discuss almost. It's, it's something that starts when you learn to know them and it's, 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 it's like a vital process that starts and goes on and goes on until the film is finished. And often after the film is finished, you will never see each other. I have not seen... Martina, since we made that film, I mean, uh, she, she, and she, yet she was so close to me, but she still is close to me, and uh, I need not to talk to her anymore because, uh, uh, and, and yeah, when we see each other in a festival, we hug, and uh, but uh, this kind of, uh, yeah, it's a kind of love making, that very intimate process that you have lived together. It is finished and it's over and after it's over you have to get to a new part of your life, a new part of film if possible and uh, it ends. She has to to get together with, uh, lately she made a wonderful film with Istvan Sabo, uh, with um, um, Helen Mir. And, uh, I, I would like to make another film, but not with her this time, because she, she wouldn't be the right person. So, but uh, I, I love to have, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in, in the days when, where I made more than one film a year, uh, uh, I, had, I had sort of a, my own entourage, you know, like uh, I could have, if I had been then in the days of, of Rome, I could have had my own court. Yeah, <laughs> that's nice to have that. That's very nice and very, uh, when you are still all the time in, in, in a, in a, like, like you, you students, you could create that amongst yourself in a, in a kind of a creative proce process that never ends. It's, it's marvelous, it's marvelous. And it can, can get so high, you can get so high in, in under the sky, yeah. You want to ask? Yeah, I was wondering about uh, your work with uh, Pasolini. Uh, about um, uh, the movie uh, Salo or Salo or whatever. No, yeah. no, I wasn't in Rome anymore. Okay. I was then making my own films. All right, all right. I had left Rome and I had left it behind, like like I left uh, Martina behind. You know, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's another part of my life. And uh, actually, from from Rome, I, my first, I had almost at the same time as I had made my first film, I had my first real success in Paris. It is a film that, uh, uh, the title is uh, The Last Days of Gomorrah. And it's, it's a science fiction film. And um, uh, that film was the first one to be shown on the first women's film festival that was ever made. It was called Musi Dora, and it was, I think, in 73. Was well, 74, 74, 74, and in the spring of 74, and um, uh, we they, they showed it in Paris, and I had uh, I had no subtitles for it, so I had to read in French what the people say said in the film. It started at 11 the festival, and this was the first showing, and uh, after I had finished, it was yeah almost one. They asked me to do another because there were so many people who wanted to see it. I, I had to do it again f for one, two, three, uh, from one o'clock to three o'clock. And at three, uh, there were so many people who wanted to see it <laughs> that I had to do it from three o'clock to five o'clock. And uh, then I had to do it from five to seven, and then from seven to nine, and then to nine to 11. And it was all the day through, it was this film. So this was kind of a breakthrough in Paris. And uh, uh, actually, my next film, which was a very small one, was already in Cannes, in, in the Cannes Festival. And it was on the front page of Le Monde and front page of uh, Liberation. And yeah, then I was a darling in Paris and uh, had left behind Rome. And I didn't go back to Rome. 
Yeah, that uh, was a very good time, and I had a great time, and I did uh, in one year three films, uh, <laughs> which was crazy. Which was crazy. Yeah, but but uh, I I was so full of energy and so much wanting to do it, and uh, uh, yeah, the path was open, and uh, the time was there. Kronos, as the Greeks said, the good time. With the Germany Pale Mother, I had really the very big success. Uh, it was shown in, 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 in Berlin, in the Berlin Festival of 1980. And that was a very, very crazy thing because um, um, the showing in the cinema in the evening was, uh, was four minutes standing ovation for the film. Four minutes standing ovation was not easy for a German film to get at that time. And the next morning, the press was <coughs> like that, the German press. But not, not that they said this is a bad film. They said, this woman is so untalented, you cannot see how she gets more money, f even uh, um, how she gets money for her films. She, she, she cannot understand why she gets money for her films. So, yeah. That was, uh, that was horrible, that was horrible. And I had then, like with this, I had to cut out uh, half an hour. So all the viewings of the film all over the world uh, that had been sold to 50 countries in this world immediately uh, were with this clipped version. Still there is one version left that was in the Berlin Festival, the, those two hours and 30 minutes. And now the Cinematheque will restore it. So finally, <laughs> finally, yeah, finally. And I think when people will see this Clara Schumann film later on, they will see the right version is the one with the girl in the beginning. The pure, simple, but powerful way and not this mediocre mediocre and sad uh, beginning that you've seen uh, yeah actually I do have two questions because I really uh, identified myself very much with Clara both because I fell in love with Johannes Brahms <laughs> uh, I thought it was a fantastic love story and I got really frustrated about Robert's uh, egoness and uh, both in how he treated her as a woman and an artist and that she really needed to be his slave <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, I mean I realized that was a complicated love story but is this based on the true story is uh, is yeah yeah of yeah, course uh, everything or I mean not no, not but everything. she was uh, she you believe that she was even a, a bigger bigger star than he was no, um, no, no, no. I, I, and, and I can't agree with you. I love Robert too. I feel, I feel very much uh, uh, for him because I feel that he is struggling so much with his illnesses in his head, and 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 uh, I don't know what kind of a disease he had. Nobody knows really because we 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 have not lived in his time. And but I think it must have been a kind of schizophrenia of of a. And uh, yeah, he, he, he wrote about these voices in his head and, and, and that they were kind of uh, syphiling and uh, then big orchestra and choirs and all that. No, I, I think he didn't make her a slave. He just, he just had to, to, work, to work on to, to finish as much as possible in that time which he had. Sometimes I feel like him when I'm... I feel the, the pain of the illness I have, and I feel the, the, uh, the anxiety, and I feel, yeah, but I have to finish this, or I, it, I need a moment like this today where we see this film together and you say, yes, it's the better version, yeah? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this is, this is, this is uh, no, I, I, I don't think that she is his slave. Sometimes I hate her. There are moments in the film where I hate her, where I think she is, She's just uh, kind of unkind with him when he, 
uh, but but seen from her side, of course, she she needs to be unkind. She needs to to feed her children. She 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 has to work, and uh, of course, the young Brahms is is uh, is a wonderful uh, wonderful person and uh, somebody who yeah was very attractive yeah. and it, he was meant to be I mean I, I told my actors he is the the sexual object of the two of them in a way you know they have both fallen in love with him and uh, uh, they their way of making love is making music and so let's let's make music as if it were making love yeah and that's what they did I think but wasn't she you in a sense no of of being an artist that has to struggle so much to be able to do no. her art. No, 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 no. As my mother is not me. I mean, uh, no. I'm 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 not so much identifying with her. Sometimes yes, but but mostly I I just see her and I admire her for her wonderful way of playing the piano, for her wonderful way of understanding music. But uh, no, she is not me. No, I'm not my, the persons of my films. They are persons who are with me, who are part of my family in a way, a spiritual family. But um, I would as much identify with a, with a cook who, who runs away because uh, there's nobody to eat her food. I mean, that's sad. She's, she's an artist. She would like to make good food. But she runs away because nobody is interested in good food in that house. Huh? They are all drunkards and, and, and drink themselves to death. Uh, but but, but uh, uh, who cares for a for good, <laughs> good meal? Nobody. Uh, I think it's, it's not wise when you make films that you identify too much with your characters. It makes you blind for the other characters. And being blind for the other characters is making a poor movie. See that in Shakespeare. Shakespeare is not one moment in the tiniest person. He is identifying, or in, the, in his, his main characters, he's never identifying. He's always seeing them with a little distance and showing their good sides as he shows their bad sides. And that's how, how good theater and good drama is made. Mm -hmm. um, identification is something for amateurs. That's where the, where the word amateur come f comes from. It's uh, to love. Yeah, you can love. Of course you must love. But you must not love one person. That is not, not uh, good for your movie. Because if you love just one person, then the others will all get like like uh, paperwork they will get not three dimensional but one dimensional and that is not good did you have your own production company to be able to decide yourself mm -hmm. yeah also in this case but uh, in this case i told you already that uh, this uh, production the owner of the production company he he was always saying that he would go bankrupt and if, if I did not agree, I would go bankrupt with him because we were in one production. And then uh, I would have to pay for all his debts. Um, yes, I wonder if you could tell a little about uh, No Mercy, No Future. Because I wonder about in the beginning of the movie, it's, it's uh, written that uh, it's based on a story or a letter or something. And I wonder how you worked with the, the schizophrenic part. Um, how much did you think about that? And how did you instruct the actors yeah, yeah, about that film? And if the story is only based on this letter? Thank you for this question. Um, that is uh, quite important. Yeah, it's it's after Germany per mother, I got um, almost like a book that a schizophrenic woman had written. And she, she asked me to do a film on what she had written. And um, I showed it to Thomas, to Thomas Mauch, the father of my daughter and uh, my director of photography. And he said, oh, that's a wonderful story. And, uh, and we, we, we read that together. And um, 
it was confused. You cannot imagine how confused it was. But it was these scenes that are in the film, in all this big stuff. And I found that quite amazing. And um, I had uh, worked with this wonderful actress, Elisabeth Stepanek, who is um, also in Germany Per Mother. She is the sister of Eva Mattes in that film. And uh, I asked her, Elisabeth, ah, what do you think about that? And she said, let's, let's do that. Huh? Let's try to somehow get money and uh, let's do it. Yeah. And um, it was all uh, improvised with amateurs. But then I was already very skilled. You need a lot of training as a director to do that. Huh? That's uh, really kind of the uh, in circus with you would stick the high up there because uh, you can break your neck at any second. Uh, and um, also for, for the actress. And she was the only one who knew what would happen. And uh, we would arrange the scenes. And uh, I had selected the, the people I wanted to do these scenes with. And uh, they were there. <laughs> and uh, uh, we created a situation that they were put in. And uh, Elizabeth would guide them. And we would shoot her. <laughs> and that took 17, 17 days. We had 17 days of shooting, which is almost nothing for a film like that. And 35, and uh, it was 35 still with the big stuff, big lamps, big camera. Big and we were very poor. We were all carrying ourselves like we had done in uh, Under the Pavement is the Beach. We had always to carry <laughs> the whole material ourselves. But it was great, I, not, not fun. I mean, fun is not the word, but it was a very special kind of pleasure. Mm -hmm. Pleasure in a way, uh, very, very exciting, very um, dangerous, very dangerous. We were all the time on ice that might broke, break any second. Yeah, but the uh, film was then shown in Cannes and uh, People cried and, and went out and slapped the doors and one was one woman was uh, fainting and uh, one was uh, was uh, expecting childbirth and she was brought out with a ying, 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 ying. <laughs> it was <a> crazy <laughs> yeah but uh, I think it was uh, at least fifteen years before Lars van Trier huh? it was a uh, really a very wow wild film and that's what we wanted to make a wild film about the berlin of these days and uh, i think we were shooting in november yeah uh, very cold and then next year we were in Cannes. it's uh, high speed <laughs> yeah i just uh, wonder you have uh, told us about and gave us uh, short views of uh, film history from rome but you are yourself a part of the new German wave. But uh, I just wonder what happened when it's uh, stopped. Yeah, that's a sad story. It, it was wonderful until, until 80, 82. And uh, when Fassbinder died, um, it's, it was a moment where it was politically not possible anymore. Up to that time, there was really a kind of enthusiasm to, to help us and to help us with our films. But after Fassbinder's death, which in my opinion was not a suicide <coughs> and not an overdose, but something that, an overdose that was meant to kill him, that was given to him. And uh, because politically afterwards things changed so much. And I can tell you it's al always when you, when you look why things happen, it's mostly because of money. We had been fighting so much for um, money for our films. But uh, there were the producers, the producers who wanted it for themselves. And to work with us would mean to work with authors like me, who have you know, their own ideas, who want to do it this way, and this way, and this way, and who know not a lot about money, and who know a lot about technique, and they can fool them. 
And uh, uh, that's why they, I think they wanted to get it out, get us out of this new system, which was the system of funds of the different, what we call lender of the regions of Germany. And these, these lender funds were strictly against us because they were from the beginning, they, the, the produce, producers had put their people in there and uh, they, they, they was immediately, um, when they were built up, they, they were against our generation. They were not giving us money. That was true for Werner Herzog, that was true for Wim, that was true for many others that maybe you don't know and for me too. For me too. For me, uh, especially, I had the chance to have. Would ha I would have had the chance to have the money in Paris, um, but I told you that it was for my daughter that I went back to Berlin, knowing this. Uh, but uh, also, of course, in Berlin, uh, anyway, as you know from from uh, Germany, Pell mother's strange kind of success. Um, I was already not, um, how can you say, um, a person that they didn't really want anymore. Yeah, and I should have gone back to Paris maybe, but then uh, there is another reason. It's not, not only my, my, it's not only my daughter that was the reason to, to go back to Berlin, it was also that my stories are German stories, and I'm rooted in Germany, and I feel that uh, that the French stories are the French stories. It's different. It's it's something else, and it's it's another way to to respond to the world. And after the success of Germany per mother and uh, uh, Future of Emily, I I was already having um, an apartment in Paris. And my, my little daughter was um, was then, I think, five years old. And uh, she I had to take her with me to Paris. And she, she was so unhappy. She said, uh, let's go back to Berlin. Paris is all stones, all stones, nothing but stones and restaurants. Stones and restaurants. I hate it to be here. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I, I was so successful in Paris. They were, I mean, every every one of the big producers wanted to make a film with me, and uh, and I had this little girl that was so unhappy, and uh, and I decided to go back to Berlin, uh, in a city where people, yeah, at least uh, the critics hated me, and uh, nobody wanted to give me money, and the world, life was very very difficult for me. But then I thought, and I think even today I would say, do the same thing. Movie is wonderful, but compared to a child, it's nothing. It's nothing. Great music is wonderful, but compared to a child, again, it's just, it's just music. And a child is, is once again the world. A child is a, a new life your own life again in another being and uh, your answer to the world will always be your child and not your film when you were uh, in germany making your movies in the uh, together with uh, other colleagues like uh, uh, fassbinder and herzog and all of the, the other directors what kind of communication did you have, and how did you collaborate, or if you were concurrents, and if you have some knowledge to, to share with us about that? Um, I try to be short. Uh, listen, Germany is, um, the, the, from outside, people think of the new German wave as something that was, you know, was just a, a thing of friendship, of, of the people living closely together. This was not the case. Uh, uh, Fassbinder was for a long time in Bochum, and then he went to Berlin. Um, I was living in Cologne, and then I went to Berlin. Um, Wim was, uh, came from Munich, and so did uh, uh, Schlöndorf and uh, Margarete. 
They, li were li they were living in Munich. Others were living in Hamburg, and there were others in Berlin. So it is. It was quite difficult to 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 meet. When I I met, for example, Fassbinder when I was breastfeeding my baby in airplane, and I was sitting in economy class, and he was sitting in first class, and he passed by me in his leather jacket, and he said, "Oh, how disgusting." <laughs> Yeah, and he, he went to the loo and then he came back. He came back and then he apologized and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, because he was a very kind person. He was really a kind person. And then he said, I have, I have my first class meal. Can I offer you my first class meal as an excuse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the kind of, uh, when you are a learner, when you are a student, then you, you have wonderful relationships like I had with, uh, with Pier Paolo and, and Sergio. Uh, this, this, was, this is another, another relationship, but when you are, you are... I know that Fassbinder would have liked to make some of my films, he told me. He would have liked to make uh, Shirin's Wedding, a film that you, you don't know. He would have liked to make... Uh, um, Last Days of Gomorrah, which you don't know. And I would certainly have liked to make uh, Germany Pen Mother. This is, <laughs> he never told me, but I think so. <laughs> but, uh, uh, um, yeah, but we, we, we did not really meet, but we had the same people working on our sets, you know. We, we, we meet by uh, the ele electricians or by, by our cameramen. So Jürgen Jürgens is the cameraman, for example, of, uh, of Fassbinder's Effie Briest. Uh, yeah, there were relationships, but relationships like this through, through the people we were working with. Uh, and I was uh, really from the beginning, and when I did my first films, I was recognized as, as, as one of the, the important directors. Um, I, I would like to ask, do you believe, uh, is there any special language in cinema, which is called woman language or man language? I think there are many languages in, in cinema as there are in music. Uh, and it's wonderful to have many, many kinds. Uh, going on with our thinking of chocolate, I mean, it's many kinds, many spices, many different kinds, but it's first, it has to be first class, it has to be wonderful, it has to be marvelous, it has to be excellent. I have a great hope uh, in movies, and I will tell you why. Uh, there was a time when I was, got very frustrated because the EU, the EU, European Union, had um, put out a law saying that no, from now on in chocolate you could put all other things than just cocoa, you could put uh, any kind of stuff. And I was really angry and I thought, my God, shall I eat bad chocolate, uh, Cadbury block, uh, cheapest kind, you know, all my life through, no. And I was very sad, but what the result was that short time after, everywhere were little factories producing wonderful, pure chocolate. So now we have much better chocolate than we had before. <laughs> I, believe, I mean, when you think that of cinema, now we have the time where we all eat Cadbury all the time, you know, this bad Cadbury with a lot of, uh, I don't know, cement or what they put into the chocolate. Uh, but, 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 Let's think that there will come up a lot of little factories producing first-class chocolate and people get to know how nice it is to have cho good chocolate and how good for the health, yeah? And how wonderful to make you happy. Yeah, let's be prepared to this. Let, let's make little ch good chocolate factories, yeah. But first-class, first-class, nothing but first-class. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tag so möge! Ah. Ah.